Welcome. <clears throat> this movie will explain how to do absolute calibration using a secondary standard, most likely glassy carbon standard, a piece of about 10 to 15 by 10 by 15 to 15 millimeters, a piece of black glassy carbon, one millimeter thick, provided by me or recently possibly bought from NIST. Um, which is absolutely calibrated using our USAX instrument at uh, Advanced Photon Source. So, <clears throat> most likely you have measured a data, small angle scattering data, with this little sample, and now you would like to put your data on absolute scale. Before we get to how to use this, and I'll walk you through the whole procedure in a few minutes, I have to first get to an explanation what absolute calibration of intensity means. So here is a formula which you may have seen, it's one of the many formulas which describe a scattered intensity d sigma d omega as a function of a particle uh, which has a form factor, which has a volume, it has a contrast, delta rho square. Now the proper description of the scattering, amount of scattering of such of a sample is um, includes a 1 over volume of illuminated uh, sample. So this is a volume of the sample, so it's 1 over volume of the sample. This is delta rho square, that's a volume of the scattering particle itself, that's its form factor. And in this case we ignore a structure factor. This is actually a formula for just one scattering particle. If you work out the units on this thing, you will find out that d sigma d omega will end up to be centimeter square per centimeter cube. And just if you work on this, you will see that the volume of the sample is 1 over centimeter cube because it's 1 over the volume of the sample. Then delta rho squared actually turns out to have a unit of 1 over centimeter uh, to the fourth power because it's a centimeter square to the second power. And then we have a volume of the particle squared, which is a centimeter to the sixth power. Now, form factor has no units, so you don't have to worry about that. So if you work out the mathematics behind that, you will see that you have centimeter square per centimeter cube, or as some people write, it also may be one over centimeter, which is perfectly fine. So our purpose or purpose of our procedure is to achieve um, data processing in such a way that you get uh, data on this scale. Now, a typical data processing will include some measured numbers, which you need about your sample. First one is, it would be the sample transmission. In our case, I denote it as a capital T. So that's basically how many photons pass through a sample uh, and how many get absorbed. The other thing is, we're going to need a sample thickness which I denote TH, and it should be in centimeters because as you can see all of the units for whatever reason in small angle scattering are used as a centimeter. Then you most likely have collected empty field, which I'm going to denote E to D, sample image or sample, sample exposed sample, which is S2D, and then depending on the, your type of detect, you may or may not need a dark image. Dark image is an image uh, exposed on the detector with no x-rays in the instrument. Now, it is may not be needed if you have, for example, photon counting detectors or some, some other similar ones, the newer modern detectors, uh, which have no background, no dark current effectively. It, if needed, it must be exposed for the same exposure time as a S2D and E2D. I strongly encourage you to use just one time for all of them if possible. If not, sample and empty field can be scaled together or normalized in the next step, but you should not, you should not, you should in that, if you do not have the same times for sample and empty, you should also have two dark, dark images. It's really, depending on technology, it's really difficult to scale dark images correctly. So, what we do next is, we then have a choice of doing normalization. Sometime, as I said, most likely I would suggest using collecting empty image and sample image for the same times or same uh, flux or whatever, uh, but if that cannot be done, 
then you may have to normalize them together. On really stable sources, typically desktops, you may use same time for all images, or if you need different times, then you would have to use normalization by time. On less stable sources, like a synchrotron, we typically have some kind of counting device which counts the photons before they arrive on the sample. We typically call it I0. And we basically integrate how many photons arrived on the, on the sample over the exposure time. Then we get an I0 for an empty field and I0 for the uh, sample image. Part of the pre, what I call pre-processing means that you take the 2D images uh, and subtract from both of them, from the sample and empty, you subtract the dark field. And as I said, this dark field needs to be measured for the same time as your sample image. And if you have a different empty, then you would have a second dark field for the empty. Or if you use the same time, then you just have one. And then, if needed, you can normalize by appropriate time, exposure time, or I0. For example, here what I have is, this is sample to the image normalized. It is divided by the I0 flux for the sample, and it's a sample 2D minus a dark 2D. And then you have the same thing done for the empty field. So at this moment, we have two images which have fully subtracted the dark currents, and they are fully normalized to whatever normalization method you choose to. And then we do the processing of the data. Here is, which, uh, here is a very important step. Notice that what you need to do is you need to divide your sample normalized sample by the sample transmission. In other words, you correct the sample image to a sample transmission. You have to divide by that, and then you subtract the empty field from that. If you do this correction correctly, you now have separated only the sample scattering and subtracted all the instrumental background out of it, or all or most of it. And then what we do is we divide it by sample thickness. There are various other methods how to do this correction, but not all of them are correct. Some people actually take and multiply the empty field by transmission. That would make it incorrect for the absolute, absolute calibration because you wouldn't be able to reconstruct back an intensity which is transmission independent, so samples with different transmission would effectively have a different amount of scattering, which is incorrect. Anyway, but there are other methods. This is not the only method how to achieve a properly calibrated and normalized data. Now remember, what you need to do is you also need to divide by the sample thickness. Turns out that if you think about that, the volume of the sample really is only the sample thickness because the area of the beam the illuminate the area on the sample cancels out because it's same for the sample and for the empty. So inside this calculation it will actually cancel out. So you now have a 2D image which is fully normalized, subtracted and corrected. And then that one you now need to reduce to one dimension, to 1D, by some kind of radial averaging. And this would result in fully corrected normalized data. Corrected for sample transmission, sample thickness, and normalized for whatever is appropriate for your setup. Sorry about the typos, but apparently I cannot type. Anyway, uh, there are you don't have to do all of these calculations in 2D. It is entirely valid and possible to start with reducing the 2D data to 1D data and doing all of these calculations in 1D data. That's perfectly fine. No problem. You can do that too. Anyway. This should be done by data reduction software. Just make sure the data reduction software correctly takes care of the sample thickness and correctly takes care of a sample transmission. Now you end up with fully normalized, corrected data. Oh, by the way, if you want a package which would do this correctly, then you can pick a Nika package which I wrote for Igor Pro and which you can use for your data reduction if your instrument data processing package doesn't work right. So now you have something which is perfectly corrected, everything's done, but it's not scaled to absolute scale because there is nothing, there's no relationship to absolute scale. So how do you now get a number which will scale your data to absolute scale? 
Well, what you do is you do exactly the same procedure as I just described, as you are doing for your samples. You will do it for the glassy carbon standard. When you do it for the glassy carbon standard, you're going to get data on a relative scale, fully corrected, handled, everything's done. But they, uh, you can then use my measured data, which I will provide you with the sample itself, or you can always request them later and I can send them to you later. And these data are on absolute scale. When you then take your data and scale them and calculate the correction factor for your data to put them on absolute scale using this glassy carbon, then using the same scaling, you can put all of your data measured in the same conditions with the same normalization, with the same exposure time, whatever, with everything the same. You can put all of the data on absolute scale by simply using the scaling factor. So let me now show you how to do it. What I will do is I will go in and I will load in this Igor Pro, I will load the IRENA macros. I will then go and import the ASCII data so we have them and I have put number of data sets on my desktop and so I should have data sets here. Let me have a look what I have. Okay, so I have, this is my standard glassy carbon and this is what you would get from me via email it contains Q vector, absolute intensity and uncertainty for them. So I will just import these in and then just say import. Actually, Then what we do is we take these other two samples. If you look on them, uh, I can import this one too. And I can look at this one here. And I can import this one too. And so now what we have is let's have a look on the plots. So in this case, we can go in and we can plot. This is data on absolute scale, glassy carbon M. This happens to be glassy carbon, which I provided to someone. This is an unknown glassy carbon. And you can see that the data extend in a really weird range. This actually turns out to be wide angle scattering data. So we won't be using these as a first example. And then we have, I believe the next example here are glassy carbon data which are on relative scale, which I collected with a different instrument sometime later. So first, what we need to do is now let's play with the red and green curves. And what we are looking for is some way of extracting a scaling factor, which will take the green curve and make it into a red curve. So that would be the scaling factor, which you can use for your uh, data uh, processing later on to put your data on absolute scale. So let me go in and for this I actually have a nice little tool here. It's called Data Manipulation 1 in IRENA and what we do is we take this and put a data set with the calibrated data into the data set 1. We will then put the unknown data in data set 2, add and modify and that will create this beautiful picture. Let me just zoom it so you can actually see something. Now, so this graph here shows you the calibrated data and they are on absolute scale. Turns out that the absolute intensity d sigma d omega out here is about 33, 34 in this range. And we have some unknown data. Notice these data actually do have some low Q power loss scattering. So there clearly was not something perfectly fine with that. They extend over a wider range. And if you think about that, there probably is a slight difference in background because you can see the tilts of the curves are different. Now there is a nice tool in IRENA which will allow you to easily calculate these, these, the, the, the scaling factor. What we want to do is take a rounded cursor and put it on data set, on the blue data set, somewhere where we can believe that the data are purely dominated by glassy carbon. Out here is apparently some background, uh, some beam stop scattering or something which extends to higher cues. So this is a clearly incorrect data. This is something which is wrong. Out here we're probably looking on glassy carbon data. And then if we go higher, then we're probably looking on some uh, flat background included in there. Actually, if you glassy carbon, the USEX data always have some flat background. So if you would uh, the, this should be a straight power loss slope if there was no flat background. Anyway, so select an, a range of data which overlap reasonably well. We can trust the fact that these data should scale together nicely. And then what you can do is 
hit this merge data button. If you do a merge data, the Igor Pro will run through a, a, a optimizing routine which will find the best scalar for data set 2. In this case, it's 0 0.0007966. And it also finds the best background for data set 1, which is the USEX data. And as I said, USEX data always have some flat background in them. And you can see that they overlap the data reasonably well. Now, if you don't, and this is actually made for ma for matching sector, uh, matching uh, data from different instruments together, so it also truncates the data at the same time. But we can look at that and realize that we probably have extended the range of data too high. You can see that we are unable to match this end here. So what we can go back and say add data and regraph. And we can probably put this guy a little bit higher and this one even lower. And that's because this power law slope out here clearly is a wrong data set, wrong stuff. We don't want to have that in our data. Then what we can do is hit this merge data again. And now we can see this actually much better. And you now have a scaling factor, which didn't change too much, 0 0.00791. So this scaling for the blue data set 2, for the unknown data set, is the calibration value which you want then to use. And this will put all of your data which are normalized the same way. Um, they are normalized to sample, uh, they, are, they are properly reduced, normalized by the same I0 or time or whatever else you used. And they are also scaled by the sample thickness and sample transmission properly. If you do that then and multiply them by this number, then you will get data on absolute scale. Now you can do this, this multiplication by various means. Uh, for example, if you go in and copy that, if you go back to ASCII importer to IRENA, there is a way to scale data scale imported data and then you can put your scaling factor in here and then if you if you now scale your imported data by this scaling factor it will put the data on absolute scale assuming the thickness and transmission is properly taken care of there are other methods you can go and use data manipulation and just use data set one and scale it uh, you can actually scale all of them at once by going in data manipulation and many steps and you can then go and pick your data sets and there is a uh, there is a there is a way of scaling the data normalize errors post processing here is post processing you can scale data by something so you can put the data on absolute scale here so there are various ways how to how to put the data on absolute scale in one case, I had a user who actually was using wide angle scattering, but still needed to put data on absolute scale. So I'm going to show you how to do that. In this case, if you look on this, we are seeing that this is a typical small angle scattering data and it ends around, just zoom it a little bit lower, it ends around 0.7 or so inverse angstrom. So in this case, this is a wide angle diffraction and there was an interest in actually measuring this on absolute scale. And in this case, what you, what, I, what you need to do is you need to go in and you need to put the rounded cursor on the data here, the rectangular cursor out here. And then you can simply go merge data. And what you can see is it merges the data perfectly fine, um, you know, very reasonable. Uh, you can play with that a little bit more if you want. Uh, you can take this a little bit further out and this a little bit higher. And you can then get even better fit on the data. And you can therefore put data, and this looks very good, you can therefore put data on absolute scale uh, even when the overlap is relatively, uh, relatively small. Under most circumstances, your overlap for typical pinhole sax instrument will be somewhere out here uh, over this range, because that would be a range where most of the pinhole instruments work. 
this is a most typical one. What you want to do is make sure you avoid, if possible, avoid any high end, high Q artifacts. And surely what you want to avoid any low Q artifacts as you have seen on this other data set here, uh, where this is obviously wrong. Because if you take the data set two and multiply by 0 0.0008, which is about the number, you can see that there is an obviously moment when the stuff start happening badly and things just went up like crazy. Now that also tells you that this specific instrument or this specific alignment was really bad and that you cannot trust these data below this point. So whatever you measure on your samples, if the glassy car, if you do not reproduce the glassy carbon behavior at lower cues, there's something wrong with your instrument. We know that the glassy carbon extends to at least the provided range of data 0.001 or so as a more or less flat curve. It's, it has a very, very shallow slope up. If you see anything else, if you see any behavior like this, the instrument has artifacts in this Q range and it should not be used for the data. So one of the major advantages of glassy carbon on top of providing you with absolute calibration scaling it also provides you with a very good way of, of, of checking the validity of your instrument, checking where is the range of instrument which you can trust and discarding any bad area. Clearly there was something wrong at lower cues which was not properly discarded during the data reduction which I have done. <coughs> okay, so this, this basically covers the way of getting the calibration number. And as I said, this calibration number now scales all the data which are normalized the same way to an absolute intensity. The easiest way how to deal with that is how to test it. You take this number and you go in and re-import the data. So what I do is I'll import the ASCII data. I will go in here. I'll take the unknown one and <clears throat> I will now scale the data by 0 0.0008 and then I'm going to import the data and say oh sorry I forgot this this and that and then import yes overwrite now since I now overwrote it if I now take this so we now rewrote this sample but we scaled it with the 0 0.008 so if I graph it you can see that now, after this import, the blue curve overlaps with the red curve, even though now the scaling factor is 1. So this way I verified that the data were properly scaled to absolute scale. So if I now had 150 measurements with same normalization, but scaled by the sample thickness and tra sample transmission, I can put all of them by 150 on absolute scale, by simply multiplying by 0 0.0008 and everything is done. So this is all which needs to be said, I believe, on this subject. If you have any more questions, there are papers available to you. Uh, you can find them on the web page and or you can go in here and you can say uh, check for updates. And if you do check for updates, it will show you the updates in IRENA, what is available, what is, but it also gives you a citation for IRENA, which you should use anytime you publish data reduced or, uh, or analyzed using IRENA. It also gets you the glassy carbon citation, which you use if you put data on absolute scale using the glassy carbon. There's a manuscript web page button. And uh, that's just about it. So if you have any more questions, feel free to contact me and uh, hopefully this will explain all the questions which you may have. Thank you.